For the Alex Jones Show, it's Sunday, April 6, 2014. I'm David Knight. I'll be your host today. But Alex is going to be joining us with a special report in the next segment. He's also going to have an interview that we had earlier this week. Highlights from his interview with Ron Paul. It's one of the best interviews I've ever heard with Ron Paul. It's going to be talking about, of course, geopolitics, the Ukraine. What's going to happen to the people of Ukraine? How does that fit into a reasonable foreign policy? As well as the future of Rand Paul, a whole variety of issues that Alex Jones discusses with Ron Paul. Again, that's going to be in the second hour of the show. And we've got a lot of news today. We're going to be taking your calls. Uh, some amazing news just broke the last couple of days. It turns out that the State Department under Hillary Clinton misplaced $6 billion. Gee, who'd have thought? <laughs> that's, that's billion with a B. Uh, she's now wants to run for president. I guess that qualifies you. I mean, if you're that, uh, is, is it dishonesty or is it incompetence? I don't know. But apparently, neither one would disqualify her from running. Um, she's the Democrats' front runner. But it's not just the Democrats. We see the GOP whoring itself out for sale to Sheldon Adelson. It's not just the little Sheldon Addison caucus that happened uh, about a week and a half ago where you had Jeb Bush and Chris Christie and a couple of other governors went out and sucked up to Sheldon in Las Vegas. But now he's pretty much demanding that the GOP hold their convention there. And he's got a lot of clout. He gave $100 million to the GOP in the 2012 presidential elections just for his presidential elections. What does that kind of stuff buy you? Well, it buys you bans against your competitors. The Sheldon Adelson is trying to get online gaming canceled, and he's got a lot of help, not just from Republicans, of course, but from Democrats, too. Remember, Harry Reid is from Nevada, and it was a bipartisan bill that was introduced in, I think, both houses already to try to outlaw online gambling because, you know, they could be very competitive to Sheldon Adelson. He wants people to come to Vegas. He wants them to go to his casinos. That's a much more profitable thing for him. Uh, of course, if somebody doesn't have that kind of overhead and you don't have the money to travel, you might just start gambling and doing that online. That would be a lot of competition for him. And, you know, that we see that pattern over and over again. We see that happening. There's another story from Reason Magazine today we're going to be talking about where in Florida, for example, they're going to outlaw craft breweries. That's right. If you want to brew beer in Florida, you're going to have to run that through a distributor first. So if you've got a small restaurant that's brewing beer, uh, you're going to need to sell that to a distributor, then buy it back from that distributor to sell it into in your restaurant because that's what the big guys want. Similar to what's going on in New Jersey, of course, where you see the Automobile Dealers Association trying to shut out Tesla because they don't use automobile dealers. They sell directly. So we see over and over again, this is a pattern, whatever industry it is, the big guys come in and they control it because they want something out of government. So we're going to be talking about that. We're also going to be talking about Captain America. I saw it yesterday. It's amazing. It's great. You need to see that it's, it's, whether you're looking at it for the politics or whether you're looking at it as filmmaking or just looking at it as entertainment. It's a fantastic movie on all three fronts. No spoilers. I'm not going to give anything away. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the article that was up on Drudge about what the director said, what his intentions were, and how he incorporated... All of the civil liberties issues that are on the front burner get incorporated into this movie. And folks, that's really a powerful thing. When you see these issues, we talk about it on the news all the time. And we will cover it in documentaries, show what happens to people. But when you see it in a dramatic narrative, that really can wake people up. A very, very powerful film. I hope that you go see it. I hope you take some friends who maybe don't really appreciate where the police state, where the surveillance state is leading us and the danger of that. That's a, a great film. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Also, we're going to have a clip of some creepy, predictive uh, things about technology and the police state from 2007. As Brian Williams and NBC ran this piece back in 2007, talking about what life was going to be like in 2017. And all the things that you and I don't like, if you don't like the police state as much as I don't like it, are there. So we're going to be having that. We're going to, that's something that's kind of been the background, but stay tuned. We're going to be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight on this Sunday, April 6, 2014. Now, this week, we had a tragic shooting again at Fort Hood. About 20 people were shot in a period of only about 10 minutes. And, of course, we had a couple of reporters go up there, Kit Daniels and Jakari Jackson, to the press conference 
They asked the general who was giving the press conference, they asked him how long it took for people to respond, because that's one of the issues. Should people be armed there? But the other big issue that nobody else was asking either was, was he on an SSRI drug? Because this has been the common link in all of the mass, sh mass shootings. And the answer was yes. And Alex Jones has more information on that right now. An active shooting scene in Texas, a shooting at the Fort Hood Army Base and the Texas Department of Public Safety. Four people are dead, including the shooter, and the number of injured has jumped to 16. At 5.05 this evening, we were notified by officials from Fort Hood that there had been a uh, shooting incident uh, over there. This past Wednesday evening, we saw yet another tragic mass shooting at a U.S. military base. Of course, just last year, we saw the Naval Yard shooting, and sure enough, it turned out that that individual was on multiple psychotropic drugs. And within hours of the latest shooting at Fort Hood that claimed the lives of four people and injured 16, including the shooter who died, we learned that he was on a, quote, cocktail of drugs, starting with Ambien, which its own insert admits can put you into a zombie-like trance state where you can go out and engage in violent acts, literal psychotic breaks. The inserts for the drug admit that it is a hypnotic antipsychotic that is extremely powerful and can cause someone to not even know what planet they're on. But this is something given to millions of Americans and dubbed a sleeping pill. No, ladies and gentlemen, Ambien is not a sleeping pill. And the larger issue here is, when are we going to wake up to the fact that in almost every mass shooting and almost every military mass shooting, the soldiers and the general citizens are on different types of psychotropic drugs, whether it be Luvox, whether it be other drugs in the Prozac family or Ambien. All of these drugs, own inserts, admit it increases suicide, causes megalomania, causes people to go on psychotic rampages, causes people to black out and not know who they are. And the bigger issue here is it's getting worse because we have a record number of 22 servicemen and women committing suicide every single day in this country. Suicide deaths outnumber combat deaths now for four years running. The number of suicides that we're now seeing in the military are seven plus fold the previous record at the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. This is an epidemic. And the system's answer is to throw more pills at the troops whose own inserts say causes you to have increased suicide. It's just like I told Piers Morgan last year. You've got all these serotonin reuptake inhibitor antidepressant ads on, and you're here blaming gun owners for what happened at Sandy Hook when the reported shooter, it turned out, was on multiple, you guessed it, psychotropic SSRIs yet again. How about Prozac? You know the number one, oh, that's the big sponsor, isn't it? Or that whole class of drugs. Let me ask you a question. Oh, whoa, got to cut that off, don't you? No, don't want to talk about the U.S. Tell number one cause of death is suicide now because they give people suicide Calm mass down. murder pills. Calm down. Your answer is get more money to the psychiatrist and psychologist to put more crazy people on drugs that make them kill people, Pierce. You take some video game head obsessed with shoot 'em up games, you put them on drugs that put them in a trance state, what do you think is going to happen? Same thing with soldiers. You take people who are serving, on average, four tours now. That's never been done before. Some of them as many as 10 tours in heavy combat. The most was two in Vietnam or World War II. And then you put them when they're upset and depressed on hard core drugs that whack them out of their minds, what do you expect is going to happen? Separately, our reporters, Shikari Jackson and Kit Daniels, drove to Fort Hood from Austin and sat there through the press conference as softball questions were thrown out. The only reason it came out that the reported shooter, Ivan Lopez, was on drugs was because our reporters, the reporters from Infowars.com, asked the question. 
And they went on to point out that if it was a 15 minute response time for the military police to get there, why wouldn't we then allow concealed carry on the base? And the general said, oh no, I want the professionals to be able to have guns. You know, we don't want to have our military, who supposedly fights for our Second Amendment, to have the right to defend themselves. Here are some excerpts from that press conference where the Lieutenant General, the commander of the base, responds to questions from InfoWars reporters. Was he on any sort of medications? He was on medications, that's correct. Like SSRIs or antidepressants, anything of that nature? Yes. What are your thoughts on the culture of carrying concealed weapons on base? Uh, you're not allowed to carry concealed weapons. Do you think that should change? Uh, no, I don't think so. We should have concealed weapons on base. We have law enforcement agents. Uh, we're trained professionals, and I, and I don't endorse carrying. How long did it take weapons? for the law enforcement to reach the scene? Uh, it was within minutes. Within minutes. The exact time, probably 10 to 15, maybe. So Max. you're saying that we should have concealed weapons, but it still takes 10 to 15 minutes for law enforcement to even reach the scene? What's your comments on that? I think the law enforcement acted very rapidly uh, and swiftly, uh, given the nature of the circumstances. I understand that, but there's still people yeah, that have died. I'm debate uh, with you on carrying weapons on a military installation. Quite frankly, I'm surprised that the Lieutenant General Miley was even honest about the fact that the shooter was on a drug. And we've now learned at least three drugs, including antidepressants, a dangerous cocktail. Usually, government works to hide that fact. But come on, General. Crime statistics don't lie. Concealed carry massively lowers crime. And it gives the general population, whether they be on a military base or whether they be in their private home, a chance to protect themselves when a criminal or a mass shooter tries to attack the general population. But regardless, deer kill more than 200 people a year jumping out in front of cars. Mass shooters only kill about 165, and most of that is gun-related. So in truth, the, quote, scourge of mass shootings is nothing but a giant hoax. Cancer kills hundreds of thousands a year. Car accidents, hundreds of thousands. Uh, Drug-resistant strep kills hundreds of thousands. Guns used in mass shootings kill less than 200. And the truth is, the FBI's own crime statistics show it, Violent crime is down 51% since 1992, directly because of increased gun ownership and concealed carry nationwide. It's time to really start caring about our military and not making them serve five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten tours. It's time to give them the real counseling and the love and support they need, not hop them up on a bunch of drugs so you can later declare them mentally ill and strip them of their Second Amendment. Because that's the real agenda here of abusing our military personnel until they break, is a plan to demonize our veterans. As Obama's Justice Department has openly said, they believe the number one terror threat in America, and they believe I believe Homeland Security's main mission is dealing with returning veterans. The statistics don't show that. The statistics show, and history shows, the real threat is out of control, tyrannical governments. The type of governments that demonize our veterans. Bottom line, it's an inalienable, basic, God-given right to defend yourself. And it belongs to every man, woman, and child on this planet. Not just to Americans. And not just to the rich elites who want the monopoly of power. Because it was Mao Zedong, the greatest mass murderer in history, who said political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. And that's why they want us disarmed. Now let's go back to David Knight and his live reports here on the Sunday Radio Transmission. That's right, and we're going to be right back. We're going to have more on this debate. The lieutenant general said he didn't want to have the debate there with Kit Daniels, but we are going to have that debate, and we'll be right back with that and other news. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host today. Now, we just had a special report from Alex talking about this Fort Hood shooting last week, and the two issues, besides the number of people that were killed, uh, there was four people, I believe, and 16 people, four people killed, 16 people shot, 20 people killed in the space of 10 minutes, and Kit Daniels engaged the lieutenant general asking him if he thought that it might be better to have soldiers allowed to carry sidearms, because 10 minutes is a lot of time, especially when people are getting shot at the rate of two per minute. And of course, he didn't want to have that debate. We're going to have that debate. It's going to be talked about here. It's going to be talked about in Congress. There are people in Congress that are talking about it. Now, Alex is going to be joining us in the second hour again. This is going to be highlights from his interview this last week with 
Ron Paul. And uh, he's going to be talking to him about geopolitics. Of course, that's going to include the Ukraine, things that are happening there with the IMF, of course, economic issues, and the future of Rand Paul. A lot of different issues. They're one of the best interviews I've heard with Ron Paul. Alex is going to be doing that in the second hour. Now, one of the things that InfoWars reporters Kit Daniels and Jakari Jackson mentioned when they went there, as Alex pointed out, was the question of whether or not he was on an SSRI drug. And of course he was. He was on Ambien and some antidepressants, as the Lieutenant General said. It's a cocktail of things that have a big effect on people. Now, Ambien has been in the news quite a lot lately. We just had, in February, we had uh, Carrie Kennedy, who was uh, the daughter of Robert Kennedy, I believe the ex-wife of Governor Cuomo. Anyway, very prominent person, very well connected. Uh, she was involved in a hit and run. She was acquitted. Her excuse was she was on Ambien. She said that from the time she got behind the wheel until she was woken up with a police officer pounding on her car door, she didn't know where she was going. Now, this is something that does happen all the time with Ambien. You get ambulatory, right? Uh, they give it to people who have depression. It makes the depression worse in many cases. It makes them homicidal and suicidal in many cases. If they give it to them for sleep deprivation, sleep problems, it gets worse. They start sleepwalking. And we had a case just here in Austin where we're located. And uh, we had a guy who hit a off-duty fireman. He was riding a bicycle. The guy hit him, hit and run, just kept going. Ambien is very dangerous. That is the common thread. And yet when this happens, we're told that the gun is to be blamed. We're told that law-abiding Gun owners are to blame. They should have guns taken away from them. But even more strange than that is the idea that the government will not allow soldiers to have weapons on military bases. That was always the case until the Clinton administration. Now, a lot of people like to point out that that was a policy that was actually started under Bush the first. He actually created that policy. It was actually implemented, however, under Clinton. So you've got Bush the first, you've got Clinton, you've got Bush the second, you've got Obama, Republicans, two Republicans, two Democrats. They all agree now that the military should not have weapons on base. This is the same kind of idiotic thinking that harasses airline pilots with, who are carrying nail clippers because they might become terrorists with those nail clippers. Never mind the fact that they're actually flying the airplane. So when you're going to give weapons to soldiers state-of-the-art military weapons like we have, and heavy weapons, but you're not going to allow them to carry sidearms? Come on. The military understands the importance of deterrence. Sometimes deterrence can be there because people see that you've got the weapon. Sometimes deterrence is there because they don't know if you've got the weapon. So both open carry and concealed carry are effective deterrence. They prevent crime. They stop crime. But let's talk about what the, what's being said right now. Of course, on Friday, we had a couple of representatives here in Texas weigh in on this. We had Rep Representative Mike McCall, who is on the Homeland Security Committee. He said, I personally think if you're trained for combat, you ought to be, carry, you ought to be able to carry a weapon. Yes. And, but then he was pushed back by uh, Representative John Carter, who said, well, I think it's kind of like uh, your home. And in my home, I should be able to tell people who has guns and who doesn't. The forts are the homes of the army, so the army should be able to tell people who has guns and who doesn't. Well, the problem is, is that they're not doing a very good job of that. And the problem is, is that we know that when people have firearms, you're actually safer, not more dangerous. But it also brings up the question as to, is the army a servant of the people or is the army the master? That's a question we need to start having. Because when you have a standing army, and the army has been standing now for 60 years, it's been used for continuous warfare abroad. And as Madison had pointed out to us, a army that, is, that defends us against enemies abroad will eventually become the instruments of tyranny at home. And we see that happening now. We see militarization of the police. We see heavy-duty equipment that is coming down from Fallujah and other places, these massive uh, military, th mine sweeping uh, operations, the massive uh, tanks that they're giving to police departments. This is a very concerning thing because it looks like they're trying to militarize the police, and they are. It's not just the equipment that they're giving them, it's the training that they're giving them. As we see when we look at places like New Mexico, where they're teaching them, uh, giving them no hesitation shooting drills, teaching them to shoot first. We've got even 
police officers at the state academy in New Mexico saying they're going to not teach that because it's dangerous, because it violates everything that they've always done as police. This is being driven from the federal government that wants to militarize the police. But it's also being driven in many other ways. We just had a Supreme Court ruling that didn't get a lot of attention this last week. It was the Castleman case. And it was a ruling basically about domestic violence. They tried to push the Second Amendment issue to the side, but it illustrates the slippery slope that we get on when we start saying that people who are quote unquote insane should not have a firearm, should have their guns taken away from them. In this particular case, it's about domestic violence. Now we would all agree that somebody who is bona fide insane, somebody who is, has a history of domestic violence should have their firearms taken away from them. They should be put in prison for that matter. But the deal is, is that what, how do you define that? How do you find what domestic violence is? How do you define what a convicted felon is? You know, people can get a felony just for releasing balloons on the beach in Florida. Look it up. That's the case. Now, in this particular Supreme Court case, the majority concluded that domestic violence encompassed acts that, quote, one might not characterize as violent in a non-domestic context. Hmm. Sounds like they're not really talking about violence. They said the federal law defines a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence as one involving the use of physical force. That's what uh, the defendant argued in this. And he argued that the state law under which he was charged did not require proof of such force. Now, Sotomayor, who wrote for the six justices deciding in uh, the majority, said that domestic violence has to be understood broadly to include seemingly minor acts. And the word violence, standing alone, connotes substantial force, she said. But that's not true when you're talking about domestic violence. Here's how she defines domestic violence. Example she gave in the opinion. Domestic violence could include pushing, grabbing, shoving, hair pulling, or a squeeze of the arm that causes a bruise. Now, writing a dissenting opinion, Justice Scalia said that this is, to redefine violence this way, is an absurdity that it is that is at war with the English language. See, that's the problem. They talk about people being insane, not having guns, having that right withdrawn from them, people who are felons. How do you define somebody that's insane? That's always been the charge against dissonance in places like the Soviet Union. You can lock people up on the accusations of one doctor, not on a jury of their peers. This is a very serious, slippery slope that conservatives, in many cases, are putting us on. We'll be right back with more news. Hillary Clinton lost $6 billion. We're going to have that story coming up. Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. I'm your host today. We're going to be taking your calls in a few minutes on the news of the day. Let me give you that number. It's 877-789-ALEX. That's our Sunday number, 877-789-ALEX. Now, we were talking just before the break about the Fort Hood shooting, about guns, and we've got some important breaking information about what happened in Chicago as they allowed concealed carry. But before we do, I want to tell you that this half hour of the Alex Jones Show was brought to you by My Patriot Supply. You know, we're seeing attacks on our freedoms like never before, and the path to liberty starts with attaining a level of self-reliance. My Patriot Supply is the home of a wide variety of survival products, including the Patriot Pantry line of emergency food storage products. Patriot Pantry is delicious, nutritious, and prepares in minutes. Patriot Pantry offers an amazing variety, great taste, and is packaged to last up to 25 years. Visit MyPatriotSupply.com slash Alex today to experience top-rated customer service, top quality products, incredibly reasonable prices, products you need, service you expect, and prices you can afford. Visit MyPatriotSupply.com forward slash Alex today. Now, you may remember that last year, there was a fight going on in Chicago. They tried to do everything they could as they lost in the courts to try to stop concealed carry. It happened anyway. Now we learn that gun advocates are telling us that concealed carry laws have resulted in the lowest murder rate in the first quarter of this year. The lowest murder rate they've seen in Chicago for more than 50 years. The first three months of 2014 have seen the fewest numbers of homicides since 1958. Six fewer than this time in 2013, 55 fewer than this time in 2012. This is from the Chicago Sun-Times. And Louis Gohmert, a Texas Republican, had said, of course, when he tried to, when he testified in support of this, he said, the facts are that every time guns have been allowed, concealed carry has been allowed, the crime rate has gone down. That's exactly right. And that's why 
So many of us want to see soldiers who are trusted with the state-of-the-art military weapons, trusted to protect themselves, to protect others with sidearms. You know, somebody can always get off a sucker punch. They can always get off one shot, but they may not do it if there's a deterrence. The military seems to understand deterrence when it comes to the overall picture, but they don't seem to get it when it involves just one individual, or at least they don't want to. Uh, now, we also had some other news out of Chicago. Cops are saying that no charges are going to be filed in the first case of a person actually protecting himself with concealed carry. So we believe that the murder rate has gone down because the deterrence of people knowing that people are armed with it. And of course, if someone pulls out a gun to defend themselves from somebody else who is threatening them or who has pulled a gun on them and it stops at that point, you don't get a police report. You don't get any statistics on that. Only if the police are called. Now, in this particular case, you have a 53-year-old man with a valid concealed carry permit in Chicago. He was able to shoot at two men who tried to accost him outside of his home at 2.30 in the morning. One of the two men pulled a handgun from his waistband, pointed it at the man who took out his own gun, and managed to fire several times at the males. After the shooting, the police responded and determined that the man was shooting in self-defense and he had all of his paperwork together. Hey, that's exactly the way it's supposed to work out. And we see a police chief in Detroit who knows that, who knows that that helps the situation. He was uh, somebody who, when he was in California, he was all for gun control. Then he became a police chief in Maine. And he realized that even though people there were armed at a very high percentage of the population, that crime there was much lower. And he eventually came to realize that it was an armed citizenry citizenry that helped to keep that crime rate low. And when he went to, to uh, Detroit, he kept that policy in place. And we have seen now in Detroit several situations where people had their home invaded and fought off the attackers, and the police caught those attackers. They're doing what they're supposed to do in Detroit. And he even pointed out that they could not get there in time to help those people. They were on their own for those first few minutes. He is encouraging people to have guns to defend themselves because you can't get there for a few minutes. A 10 minute response at Fort Hood was really pretty good for the police. The problem was 20 people got shot in that amount of time. That's the way it always occurs. Now here's another story that we didn't cover on Friday. It was uh, on Infowars, a Connecticut student suspended for asking the governor questions about gun control. This was at a college and as Steve Watson points out in the article, in a blatant violation of the right of free speech, a college student in Connecticut has been suspended after he asked Democrat Governor Dan Denel Malloy several questions about his stance on gun control at an appearance in a public forum. Now, the student approached him afterwards and asked him, said, do you have any comments about how the legislation has affected my business? His business is manufacturing ammunition. He says, all of our work got outsourced to another state. Now, because he had the effrontery to ask his lord and master, the governor, a question in a public forum, addressing him as sir, you know, they claimed that he had attacked the governor. Uh, then they quickly moved it back and said, well, just verbally attacked him. And so now he has been escorted from the campus. He was charged with harassment, making threats, and other violations of the college's conduct policies. You know, if he gets thrown out of that college, it's probably... The best thing that could have ever happened to him. They're taking his money and he's just going in debt uh, at that college. He needs to get out. He needs, he needs to go to someplace where he can start his ammunition uh, business again. Now, another piece of news that came out uh, again late on Friday. Florida sheriffs are attacking citizens' rights to keep guns in a Katrina-like emergency. We just saw in another state, I think it was, uh, wasn't it Mississippi guys, uh, where they they just, the legislature just passed and the governor is expected to sign a bill that would prohibit them from confiscating uh, weapons in a situation like Katrina. Same situation is coming up in Florida. The legislature has passed it. It has the blessing of both the governor there and the Florida National Guard. But guess who is pushing back against that? The Florida sheriffs. Kind of reminds me of that uh, law enforcement guy from New Orleans who says, you know, that nobody will be armed. We're going to take all your guns. I mean, we've played that clip over and over again. And every time I see it, I don't know about you, but every time I see it, it really, really makes me angry. Now, let's move on to some political corruption uh, that's really kind of, I guess, uh, financially based because we've had some uh, breaking news this last week about uh, campaign finance information. But we didn't hear too much about this story. Uh, State Department says 
or that we now learn with an inspector general's report that under Hillary Clinton, the State Department says that they lost six billion dollars. That's right. They misplaced it. You know, some mistakes were made. Uh, we don't really know where that is, but I guess that still doesn't affect Hillary Clinton's standing as being in running as the uh, most popular Democrat. I mean, whether she's incompetent or dishonest, that doesn't really make any difference. Uh, they said the $6 billion in unaccounted funds pose a, quote, significant financial risk and demonstrates a lack of internal control over the department's contract actions, according to the inspector general's report. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> That's six billion with a B. I mean, how many people can lose six billion and get away with it? Oh, that's right. John Corzine can. <laughs> MF Global, remember them? It just so turns out that about the same day they pointed out six billion was missing from the State Department that uh, uh, Corzine and company said, yeah, we, we found six billion dollars to pay our creditors. I wonder if there's any connection with that. Probably not. But who knows? There's always a possibility there. And, you know, she's, it might actually be something that... Um, Maybe Hillary's got the $6 billion. Who knows? I don't know. We'll have to see. You know, that's not even counting all of the black budget stuff that they've got for running arms in Benghazi uh, or running drugs, too. I mean, you know, there's a lot of black budget money floating around. So you got $6 billion missing from the State Department. You got who knows how much, how many billions of dollars they've made running drugs in Afghanistan and other places. Or just take a look at Benghazi and the arms that they're selling to Al Qaeda there. I mean, there's. The government is making money hand over fist, but according to the budget, uh, they're going into a deficit and you and I need to pay higher taxes. You know, the corruption, though, is not just the Democrats, of course, and it's not just Hillary Clinton. Uh, it is also Republicans. And we were just talking last week about how Sheldon Adelson had his own little primary in Vegas. Well, it turns out a story that's on Drudge Day. He wants the entire Republican convention to be there, and he's pretty much demanding it. We're going to talk about that right after we come back from the break because, you know, corruption is a bipartisan problem, and we're going to talk about what's at the root of that. We'll be right back. The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. Yeah, raising the deficit, that doesn't raise the debt. Yeah, right. You know, it's one of the scary things about that is it's gotten so bad that people are trying to get a constitutional convention in order to get a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. And, of course, Duncan Hunter is at the forefront of that. They believe, and we covered this article on Friday, they believe they now have 34 state legislatures that have signed on to that. Of course, some of those state legislatures have withdrawn that. The question is, can they withdraw that, so withdraw that support? The problem, though, is not that we don't have a balanced budget amendment. The Constitution really is sufficient. See, the raw, real problem is can be addressed if we just aren't on fiat currency, as Ron Paul's pointed out. If we go back to the constitutional money that is backed by gold and silver, we don't have that problem. But if you're going to just print paper money with nothing behind it, you're going to always be able to have a deficit. You know, the reason they put and defined what constitutional money was in the Constitution was because they had just had an experience with paper money. During the Revolutionary War, they printed... The Continental Congress printed paper money, and that's where the expression not worth the Continental came from. So in all these areas, if we would just return to the Constitution, if we would get out of office, people who are criminals, people who violate their oaths, that's the problem. And we cannot trust these people to rewrite the Constitution and perhaps make it stronger or perhaps eviscerate it. Who knows what they would do? I think it's a very, very dangerous con uh, problem. The Constitutional Convention, I don't think, is going to solve anything. Having people of integrity and having the guts to get people out of office, that's what's needed. Now, we were talking just before the break about some people who are trying to get into office. Hillary Clinton, of course, and she's added a new qualification to her resume. The fact that she completely lost either through corruption or through incompetence $6 billion with a B at the State Department. We also see the Republicans trying to pony up for money in Las Vegas. And uh, this is an article that was linked on the Drudge Report, Vegas or bust for Republicans. It says Las Vegas has a big advantage over the other five cities, hoping to host the Republican National Convention in 2013. And the advantage is Sheldon Adelson. He is adamant that the GOP must go to Vegas, said one source. And some GOPers fear that if Adelson doesn't get his way, He'll just give a couple hundred million dollars to the Democrats just for spite. He'll take his football and he'll go home. 
Uh, you know, he just had this little four-day bash for uh, some Republicans, the Jewish Republican, the Republican Jewish Coalition Conference. Uh, he had uh, Jeb Bush and Chris Christie and two other governors came there and basically kissed Sheldon Adelson's ring. We'll put it that way. Uh, and uh, so the question, I guess, would be if they're going to have the GOP convention there, are they going to have a separate uh, Jewish convention like they tried to do with the caucus in 2012? Remember, they had a, a Jewish only caucus on uh, a Sunday and they tried to throw out Ron Paul supporters. A lot of really corrupt stuff going on there. And of course, Shell Nadelson can give $100 million to the Republicans and still come out way ahead. It's still a very good investment for him, a very good return on his investment because they are trying, along with Democrats like Harry Reid, they're trying to stop online gambling, which is his competition. And that has always been the case. Look at this story from The Atlantic, which just came out a couple of days ago. Mega donors are now more important than most politicians. This is an article by Peter Beinert, and he says, uh, quick, name a senator who served between the Civil War and World War I. Oh, can't? Okay. Now name a tycoon who bought senators during that same period. Oh, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, you know, you can come up with a lot more, can't you? He says it's very easy to do that. And he gives an example. William McKinley raised $16 million when he ran, but his opponent, Democrat William Jennings Bryant, only had 600000 So he basically had 32 times the amount of money that his opponent did. And his campaign manager, McKinley's campaign manager, bragged about it. He said, all questions in a democracy are questions of money. Is that the way that it should be? You know, this is an article in The Atlantic, and they're decrying the Supreme Court decisions on uh, Citizens United 1 and 2. But if you're going to shut down people's free speech, that's not the way to do it. Any more than trying to get uh, money out of the system. Just as we see that uh, it's often misquoted, that the love of that money is the root of all evil. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And when we look at politics, it isn't people's free speech that's involved that's the problem. It's the amount of power that is in Washington and the favors that they can deal out and how they can unconstitutionally, I believe, shut down some businesses and favor others. That's why unless we get serious with the Constitution, unless we get serious about holding people within the limits of the law, unless we get serious about transparency, it's no, there's no way that you're going to be able to sh shut down people's free speech and participation in this. They will just go underground. And the cases that we saw in the Supreme Court cases of Citizens United 1 and 2, these are cases where small organizations were being stepped on. The big guys were already getting what they wanted. The Sheldon Adelsons are already getting what they wanted, and they're going to get what they want. It's just whether or not the smaller people are going to be able to band together and have a say-so to be able to participate, to collectively pool their resources and put out their position the big guys are going to be able to do that. They're going to go underground. They're going to do that any way they want. As I mentioned earlier, a good example of this is the laws against craft breweries that are being crafted in Florida. We're also seeing laws against Tesla. They're trying to stop Tesla from selling their cars in New Jersey because they're not using automobile association dealers. So the people who are distributors in Florida are trying to stop the sale of beer in Florida unless it goes to distributors. They're always going to government to try to shut down their competition or to try to give themselves special favors. And that's what you see with Sheldon Adelson. He's trying to shut down his competition. One last thing here on politics, and then I want to go to the police state news that we've got here. Romney's return to public life stoked speculation about a potential run in 2016. I don't think he's going to run again. He's been pretty adamant about it. He's, uh, you know, he's already lost once. That's very unusual for somebody to... Uh, uh, to run again after they've lost. It has been done, but it's very unusual. But here's the interesting thing I thought about this article that was on Drudge Report. It says he's appeared on TV news shows 12 times in the past six months, essentially on pace with Michigan's Mike Rogers, who led all national politicians last year with 26 appearances. That's interesting because, you know, Mike Rogers, after becoming the poster child for the surveillance state, is now not going to run again. And what was considered by many to be a safe Republican district, although it's gone both ways in the last two uh, presidential elections. One of them, it went uh, slightly for the Democrats. Another one, it went slightly for Republicans. 
And as bad as it has been with all the revelations about the NSA spying and his absurd defenses of it, his absurd cheerleading of the NSA's dragnet surveillance programs, I think they're worried that he couldn't get reelected. And so uh, I don't know, is, is Mitt Romney auditioning for a place on uh, talk radio like uh, Mike Rogers? <laughs> I don't think so. I think Romney already owns uh, Clear Channel, so I don't think he really needs to worry about that. Now, Darren McBrain contacted me about a video that he saw that was put out in 2007. And they were talking about what life was going to be like in 2017. If you remember, the globalists are always talking about 2020 as a time when they're going to get everything put together for this surveillance state, for the police state, for even the beginning of transhumanism. Look at this. Yeah, we're going to have to do this in the next segment. But I want you to see when we play this exactly what they're talking about in 2007. Look at how much of this has come true. Think about the implications of uh, Obamacare and of biometric data. And we're going to talk about the company that does the biometric scanning on this. Basically, what they're saying is that they're going to look at everything that we do, follow everything we do. And of course, we've seen this happening. People don't understand how important metadata is. Metadata is even more important than your conversations and your emails because they can use that metadata to profile you. And it isn't just the biometrics that they were talking about in 2007. It's many, many different ways that they can grab you. And it's, it's not if you just give them your biometrics. They can get your biometrics now from Facebook. Facebook has exploded since this came out. And most people already have their faces in a database. We're going to be right back with more information and what they were planning in 2007. See if they haven't already got it. We'll be right back. To the Alex Jones Show, I'm David Knight. It's Sunday, April 6, 2014. We're going to go to your calls here. I've got this clip from NBC in 2007 talking about what life was going to be like in 2017. An amazing clip, and I want to get your reactions to it. But we don't have that much time in this segment, so we're going to play it in the next segment. Let's go uh, to Chris in Kentucky, because we talked about concealed carry in Chicago earlier, and I, he had a, a comment about that. Chris, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Dave. I lived in Chicago for many years up there since the 70s into the late 80s, and you're absolutely right. The more guns you take away, the more crime you have. It got worse in the 1980s when the gangs had, to, had just taken many districts of the cities and wondered why we need more police, we need more people to take more guns away from the law-abiding citizens. And guess what? It's been disastrous since. It's just as in New York City, another place. And it's getting to a point, I hope people wake up and realize the more guns you have in a city or a town, the less crime you have. You've documented that. It's that's, absolutely right. That's right. A couple of weekends ago in Louisville, Kentucky, we had a bunch of teens that went on a rampage. A lot of people got injured. A lot of people were, were hospitalized. Well, how many of those people that had a concealed carry, if, those, if they would not have been robbed or their children hurt, you would have stopped that right instantly. The police cannot be there all everywhere at once. But they always would rely on us. If you have your cell phone, oh, the government's going to be there or the police are going to be there to save you. No, that's not the case. You're going to have to defend yourself. It takes a split second before you can be killed in a crime, Dave. That's, is it, you're absolutely right. It's time that we've got to get all 50 states to concealed carry. This is our republic. We've got to take it back. Very, very true. You know, I've spoken many times to Jim Gearock. He's with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And uh, he pointed out he was a prosecutor in Chicago, in Cook County. And he said 80% of the shootings there are related to the war on drugs. They're gang related. It's not because you've got too many guns in there. Uh, basically, they were essentially prohibiting guns from being in there, but they were still coming in in a massive amount. People were still shooting each other because criminals are still going to have those guns. It is a deterrent. It's something that people like the police chief in Detroit understand that, and hopefully we can get more people to understand it. It's a it's a uh, information war, I think, to get people to understand that. Thank you so much, Chris in Kentucky. Let's go to uh, Mitchell in Louisiana. You wanted to say something about medications. Hey, David. Um, yeah, I wanted to say that I'm the second of three generations in my family that have been victims of the CPS in the United States. And when I was taken from my family, thankfully we were able to get my son out of the country before they actually got their clammy hands on him. But when I was in the system... Um, I was in a bunch of different foster homes and an adoptive home, and when I hit adolescence, as is far too normal enough, 
in that scene, when I hit adolescence, they dropped me like a wet rag, and I went into boys' homes and federal facilities for youths. Mm. And in my youth, in my teen years in these facilities, I witnessed just crimes against humanity is really the only way I can word it. And what they, they were experimenting on these children and me with these uh, psychotropic medications. And over the years, I've just seen so many children just begging to die, just suffering, suffering. A lot of them weren't even crazy. A lot of them did not have significant problems of any kind. A lot of them were very somewhat intelligent children just struggling because of their family situation, because the government had taken them from their homes and they were being put on all these hardcore psychotropic medications. Doctors from D.C. would fly in once a month and switch up the medications. They were constantly putting us on multiples, different kinds of medications all at the same time, taking us off, putting us on new ones. These kids were just seizing up, these totally would-be healthy children seizing up constantly, mm. creating all kinds of problems in their life. And it was the biggest insult to me was after those years when I got out and I went on with my life. The biggest insult to me was the ignorance of the American people on average. And when I try to talk to my fellow countrymen about the crimes against humanity that I had to live through in my youth, my, my fellow American, on average, turns to me and they call me a liar. They tell me to shut up. That would never happen in the United States. That's impossible. And it's just Mitchell, so we, have, we have heard your story over and over and over again from people. It is such a sad story. I know it's true. I have close friends who were foster parents, and the kids that they were trying to help came to them with a long list of drugs that they had to give them. It's a very, very corrupt system. It's a very sad system. I'm so sorry you went through that. We're going to be right back. A chemical spill contaminating the water supply and not... It's Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we've got some callers on the line. At the bottom of the hour, Alex Jones is going to be joining us. We're going to have highlights of his interview with Ron Paul this last week. It's a very good interview. You're not going to want to miss it. They're going to talk about geopolitics, of course, the economy, what's going on in the Ukraine, and what Ron Paul thinks about the future of Rand Paul's presidential Bid. If he's going to run for president, uh, and well, I won't go any further than that. We'll let you uh, listen to that at the bottom of the hour. That's going to be Alex Jones with Ron Paul. Now, just before we left uh, in the last hour, we were talking about this piece that uh, Darren McBreen gave me about uh, NBC News, talking about where they saw society in 10 years, in 2017. They did this back in 2007. We all thought that this would be pretty interesting for you to see what they were telling us the world was going to be like and how much of this has come true. Let's take a look at that piece. More now of our special coverage here tonight, life in the U.S. in 10 years' time. By that time, there may be all kinds of new ways to safeguard and identify all those things that make each of us unique, our faces, even our fingerprints, even our eyes. Here now with more on the future of technology, NBC's Tom Costello. <laughs> The year is 2017. You're rushed to a hospital, unconscious with no ID or medical history. But thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Science fiction 20 years ago, but a biometric reality today. The technology is based on answering one simple question. Am I who I say I am? Already, fingerprints and iris scans verify passenger identities at airports. Within 10 years, that technology may be even more widespread. And look for more complex facial recognition programs that scan a crowd of thousands looking for a single terrorist. Today's facial recognition software starts with the eyes, then it maps out the contours of the face and compares that against a database of millions, a database that's growing by the day. What's next? At the University of Bath in England, researchers predict big changes for consumers. I think it is possible to free us completely of our wallets and keys using biometric technology, if that's what people want in 10 years' time. In fact, it's already here. The latest home security locks use fingerprints to control deadbolts. And at the Jewel Osco grocery store in Chicago, some customers pay using their fingerprints. No paper or plastic. You don't really need anything other than your hand and your I got that with you. So will future department stores scan our irises, like in the movie Minority Report, then offer products catered to who we are? Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to the Gap. How Experts say that technology is here now. The challenge is to safeguard our privacy in a brave new world. Tom Costello, NBC News, Alexandria, Virginia. Yeah, how are they doing about safeguarding our privacy in this brave new world? Not very good, are they? 
I thought it was interesting uh, that in 2017, this is before, of course, Obama was elected, they were already pushing the connection between biometrics and medical care. That was the very first thing you heard in that piece. Start out with an ambulance sound, the year is 2017, 10 years in the future. They, you don't have any ID. They don't know who you are. But, hey, they've got this great microchip under your skin that tells them everything. Presumably, how they can bill you, right? <laughs> And uh, who you are, because that's really what they want to know. What about your vaccination records? Are you current on that? Because then they can load you up with all the vaccines. But the real point of this is that this is not about helping people. This is about total information awareness, total control, a total surveillance grid. That's everything that they put out there. And, of course, they roll that out to start getting people used to it. It's predictive programming. We already see most of that stuff there. As a matter of fact, it's already much, much worse than what they said, and we're not even to 2017 yet. I thought it was interesting that the guy they had on there, his name was uh, Clark Nelson, and he's with a company that has now turned into Morpho. It was uh, Sagem Morpho Biometrics at the time was how they uh, had the lower thirds on there. That is a French company. It's a biometrics company. It's the largest biometrics company in the world now. And what he said is, the key question is, am I who I say I am? And see, that's where the piece took a turn. They always like to say that this Orwellian technology, this brave new world technology, is about helping you. All these robots that you see DARPA building, those are just going to help you in the case of an earthquake or a Fukushima event. No, they're there to hunt you down. Okay? And this is why they're developing these biometrics. Am I who I say I am? Let's take a look at some of the stuff that this guy's company has done. They're number one in the world in biometrics. They've got 8,000 people, 40 countries, 85 subsidiaries, 1.5 billion euros in revenue. They've got things like finger-on-the-fly technology. It reads your fingerprints on a moving hand. You don't even have to hold your hand still. They can read it on the fly. They've got fast DNA matching tools. They're also specialists in border control. See, they've already started out, and you noticed in that they said it's going to move from the airlines. They were not doing fingerprints and iris scans at the airports in 2007, but they were priming everything to roll out from there with the TSA. But this is what Morpho also supplies. And again, this is just one of the many biometric companies. They happen to be the largest in the world. They have what they call secure biometric access control at borders, fully automated e-gates. And you can see that picture there. It's like a subway turnstile if you're looking at it. It's like a subway turnstile. You go in there, it looks at your biometric data, it looks at, compares it with your travel documents, compares it with your history. And they call it the Morpho way. Isn't that nice? Uh, they also have uh, multimodal fingerprints where they look at your veins and other biometrics as well as facial ID. And of course, these people also bring us the wonderful things like uh, red light cameras and speed limit enforcement. And they acquired 81% of GE Homeland Protection in 2009. See, that's where we're headed. This is all about what the state wants. This isn't what people want. You had one quote in there from a guy at the University of Bath. He said, I think it's possible for us to free ourselves completely of our wallets and keys using biometric technology if that's what people want in 10 years' time. No, the people don't want that. The corporations want that. The governments that help the corporations, that feed the corporations, want that as well. The government has its own little agenda there, but it's also part of it is feeding this giant surveillance state. That's where we're headed. It's not about your safety. It's not about safeguarding anything. If you haven't seen the new Captain America movie, you really need to see this. This guy took on the police state, the issues of our time, Head on. Now, this is a story that was linked on Drudge Report from Mother's, Mother Jones. It says, Captain America, the Winter Soldier is about Obama's terror suspect kill list, says the film's directors. I'm not going to give you anything away. No spoilers here. But if you've seen the trailers, if you know anything about it, you know the general gist of it. And, and it was a deliberate thing, according to the directors. They said they wanted to make a political thriller. So, they, so we told them, well, if you want to make a political thriller... All the great political thrillers have current issues in them that reflect the anxieties of the audience. That gives it an immediacy. It also makes it relevant. And this is a very relevant movie, Captain America. So Anthony and I just looked at the issues that were causing anxiety for us because we read a lot and we're politically inclined. And a lot of that stuff had to do with civil liberties issues. Sure does. Drone strikes, the president's kill list, preemptive technology, all the themes that 
were worked into the film, working closely with screenwriters Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. It's a great film. It's not only great and fun entertainment, super special effects as you would expect, but it does exactly what they said. It takes the current issues, puts them in the context of a political thriller, explains it to people. I mean, what can you can you say too much about a movie that where a character explains what compartmentalization is in one sentence, makes it very clear, and where they illustrate it throughout the movie, and where they even talk about Operation Paperclip. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Action and intelligence. We're going to be right back with your phone calls. Stay tuned. Jones Show, I'm David Knight, and we were just talking before the break about this piece from NBC back in 2007, where they were so excited about biometrics, uh, the fact that the government would be able to go through and look at your face and do facial recognition and compare it to an ever-expanding database. Well, one of those ever-expanding databases, of course, is Facebook. Back in 2007, Facebook only had about 58 million views each month. It is now over one and a quarter billion each month. And that massive database has got a lot of facial pictures. So they've already got that database right there, as well as the information that Google is tracking on us. But we had a caller call in at the break uh, from uh, Wisconsin talking about biometrics and cattle. We wanted to go to him and Dennis in Oregon and Chris in Indiana. We're going to get to you right after this, so stay tuned. But uh, Ben in Wisconsin, tell us about uh, how they're using biometrics for four-legged cattle. Yes, David, sir, you've been working really hard this past week. I'm really grateful to be talking to you. I just had one of those epiphanies the, the, last night and got on with YouTube and was watching all these automatic cow systems work with 400 cattle. I mean, I used to milk 30 cattle when I was a, a kid, but can you imagine milking 400 and how they do it all with robotic work and the robots identify the cow and process that information to show just exactly what the cow's milk quality is and everything with that cow, what feed it needs and everything like that. It's just amazing. And it's biometric scans. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't have a problem when they do it to cattle. I have a problem when they treat us as cattle. And that's really what they're doing. I think they see us as their inventory. They see us as their cattle. And that's what they're doing this all for. They want to know everything, every little detail about us. It's obsessive. It's because they think they own us, isn't it? Well, if they own those cows and they're trying to get the most out of them, and that is the, the, the you, you can see how that, all that data they collected from that system to control the cows has turned to us. They just want to control us too, Dave. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it is. We are their cattle. Well, thank you, Ben. Let's go to uh, Dennis in Oregon. You had something about uh, Oath Keepers. Go ahead. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, we were talking uh, two weeks ago, I think, and I got cut off in the middle um, of the technology. Yes, yes. Okay, and, uh, go ahead. You know, I was thinking maybe your technology you recognized my voice print or something and decided it was too radical for this Alex Jones show. But uh, No, actually, our, we had problems with our phone system. Actually, it was last week. We, the entire thing went down just before okay. the, end of the end of the show. But go ahead. Tell us what you wanted to say. Sure. Well, I, I listened to um, Alex's interview with Stuart Rhodes uh, back in November last year. And he, he was talking about uh, they're going operational and setting up civilian civilization preservation teams. And so I just wanted to share uh, briefly and you know, just a, a little bit of detail on how, how we're doing that here in my neighborhood. Hopefully um, help uh, be an example to folks to see how easy it really is and um, how effective I think it's going to be as well. But I, uh, after the show, I, I, I got on their site and, and uh, found out who my local Oath Keepers guy was. I contacted him. And I found out from him that they're, they're, they're working with the existing organizations. Rather than reinventing the wheel, they want to work through uh, neighborhood watches and, and search and rescue groups. And so I, I decided, well, I can, you know, I can do a neighborhood watch. And so I called my uh, local um, neighborhood uh, policing officer in, in our county, and uh, she gave me two things. One, she gave me uh, a list of crimes that have been committed in uh, our precinct in the last year. And then, second, she sent out the neighborhood watch materials. And the thing that was interesting about those materials, they include not just things related to security, but they have a list of about 20 other things, uh, activities that a community can be involved with. And things, just things like fun and games, uh, community garden. Well, let me, uh, let me ask you this, Dennis. Uh, are you a former military or police officer, or are you just uh, joining uh, Oath Keepers as, as in another capacity? Well, I didn't really join Oath Keepers. I, uh -huh. I, I kind of, I'm following their direction, and they directed me to 
the, the neighborhood watch. Because now uh, the civilization preservation teams, were those set up for, I, I thought that Oath Keepers was doing something to help train people who didn't have any training, who had never been in the military, who had never been in the police. Is, is that the same thing or is that something different? I think this is the same thing. It's just kind of on two different levels. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the search and rescue is a little bit more advanced, perhaps, and then the neighborhood watch is just more for the average person. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's and, good. And, well, you know, I, I think people need to, they need to be aware of how they can help themselves, and they need to be aware of how they can help other people. And if Oath Keepers is putting people who have experience in search and rescue and uh, medical issues and, and stuff like that together with people who don't have that kind of training, that's really valuable. And I think yeah. it's very valuable and very imperative for people like Oath Keepers, for the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Associations. Both of them have the idea that people who have this training need to have the moral integrity to stand up for the Constitution. And we've seen a lot of, there's been a lot of movies about soldiers who have been misled and don't really understand what they're fighting for. I see that a lot with engineers because I, I come at it not from a military or law enforcement background, but I come at it from an engine, engineering background. And I know a lot of people who will go in and who will work for the military industrial complex simply because it's a paycheck or because it's very interesting work, never thinking about the moral implications of what it is that they're doing. So I think it's very important that, that we pull these things up. There's no organization <laughs> for engineers, I guess, but there certainly is for Oath Keepers. I think it's very important. I think it's what really stopped the Iron Curtain in East Germany. They got people who would no longer fire on their fellow citizens who are trying to go over the wall. I think that's a very, very important thing. And of course, Oath Keepers grew out of the unconstitutional attacks on our rights to keep and bear arms in the wake of Katrina. And we've seen legislation now introduced in at least two states to stop that from happening. And thank you, Dennis. Uh, let's give uh, Chris in Indiana a chance to uh, join in. Chris, you had something about uh, guns? Hello, Chris. Well, Chris is no longer there. I think we lost him. He hung on for a long time. You know, one of the things that came out today, or last couple of days on Drudge, was an article from Pat Buchanan. And he wrote, whose side is God on now? And it was a very interesting series of quotes. And he pointed out that the things that Vladimir Putin is saying is essentially appealing to Christianity, to civilization of Western values. And he's essentially taking that side while we've got a president who is taking exactly the opposite side. Let me read you a quote from Vladimir Putin. He said, many Euro-Atlantic countries have moved away from their roots, including Christian values. Pos polity policies are being pursued that place on the same level a multi-child family and a same-sex partnership, a faith in God and a belief in Satan. This is the path to degradation. And Pat Buchanan points out, he says, with Marxism-Leninism a dead faith, Putin is saying the new ideological struggle is between a debauched West led by the U.S. and a traditionalist world Russia that would, a, tra a traditionalist world that Russia would be proud to lead. And he points out that he's also tapping the worldwide revulsion of and the resistance to the sewage of a hedonistic secular culture and a social revolution coming out of the West. And of course, also the West's hegemony spying on everyone now right after the break we're going to have a interview with uh, ron paul this is alex jones had this interview with him earlier in the week he's talking about a billion dollars from taxpayers that's going to be going to the ukraine and is it going to help the ukrainian people or is it going to help the imf and the bankers who oppress all of us we're going to be right back with highlights from that interview with alex jones and ron paul so stay tuned we'll be right back Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. Now, Ron Paul is always a fascinating interview. And this week, Alex Jones talked to him about a variety of current events. We knew you'd want to hear the highlights. Here they are. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by the Omnibudsman, the granddaddy of the modern constitutional libertarian movement. And his son is the U.S. Senator from Kentucky in all major polls, the front runner to be the Republican nominee. And, of course, that's Rand Paul, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, former Congressman Ron Paul uh, joins us here today to cover the waterfront. Thank you for coming on, sir. He also, of course, has ronpaulchannel.com, launching his own powerful multimedia TV 
uh, print radio system. I'm on affiliates all over the country that carry his daily commentaries. And so I am able to hear those when I'm a guest. Very exciting uh, to see Ron Paul and many others like Jesse Ventura starting their own media operations. This will fully overthrow the old dinosaur media system that's already discredited itself. Uh, Dr. Paul, out of the gates, Fort Hood situation. Our reporters last night talked to the commanding general. The video's on drudgereport.com. Uh, they confirmed he was on uh, psychotropic drugs and Ambien. We're now learning he was on multiple drugs. What is your take on that as a medical doctor? Well, obviously, I think the drugs have a major role to play in this almost all the time, whether there's high school shootings or wherever this occurs, that they're uh, receiving this government-directed care for uh, psychological problems and there are psychotropic drugs. It's happening all the time. So that's the immediate thing that crosses my mind when, when I hear this. And then when you hear of it being uh, related to government and military and veterans, you can be guaranteed that they're getting the wrong kind of treatment. So medically, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the diagnosis is wrong, the treatment is wrong, and we participate. We may take one thing and make it worse. I think what, what's happened is they, uh, they, they look at these terrible acts, and yet they're merely a symptom of something else. And I think they never look for the cause. Why do people come back from war uh, with, with this uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and also the many brain injuries? Well, it's the war. It, it, it's the war that, that's going on there. And then when you think about, well, in medicine, you know, we want to pre prevent diseases. But in politics, it doesn't seem like they want to prevent the harm done because, you know, if you don't want these kind of problems, why don't we have a different foreign policy? You know, this is a consequence. So they create the conditions to jeopardize all these young people. They come back. They can't get jobs. They become depressed. We put them on drugs. We make them a lot worse. And, uh, and we don't change our, our foreign policy. We compound it. We create the we create the problem, then give them drugs and make it worse, and then everybody is just totally shocked. So how could this how could this happen? You know, and uh, fortunately, it's not happening more. I think they've created conditions uh, which are so so terrible. But the real tragedy when we hear about the killings and all, but what about the hundreds of thousands now who are suffering, and they're just falling. You know, talk about falling through the cracks. These people are out on the streets and. And they're begging for treatment, and and yet my big beef is they never look at the cause. You know, during the campaign, we used to talk about uh, I emphasize this whole thing of, of blowback. Maybe maybe we have a, a problem with terrorism, war on terrorism, because we have a deeply flawed foreign policy, and there is blowback. No, they're not going to talk about that, and they're not going to talk about wars that make no sense. And uh, that, of course, is what I would think is the important thing. Otherwise, we're going to have this problem for a long time to come. It's probably still going to cost us trillions of dollars doing the wrong thing. Well, you're an Air Force veteran, and, of course, uh, during the Vietnam era, you you saw a lot of duty there. Back, back even during Vietnam, they only made him serve one or two tours. Uh, one of my grandfathers, uh, after he served his uh, 22 flights in the Army Air Corps over Europe, was on the ground in Italy and was shaken for his whole life by the starving Italian children and the horrors he saw uh, in Italy and the rest of Europe. That was uh, just two years in the U.S. Army. Uh, and my other grandfather was uh, affected by World War II and a crash he was in, both of them in the Army Air Corps. I, I just can't imagine these guys, many of them, more than 10 tours of combat now. I don't think anybody mentally can handle that. No, and that is a big thing. That is different, uh, even though these wars are seen as not nearly as violent as the other ones. World War killed hundreds of thousands, you know, and Vietnam killed a lot more. But a lot of people went, and a lot of people were injured and uh, damaged, and, uh, and, and it's more than anybody ever imagined, and they went back and forth so often. They actually ended up in uh, these, these recent wars with more days in duty and, and worrying about what mine they're going to start, step on and get Get, and, and get blown up. But then there's the addition, uh, even though this, this problem existed in World War One and Two, but it wasn't generally talked about, it talked about now, but there's a lot more of it, and some people would think, well, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it has to do with the way we go to war. Um, you would think 
maybe it would have been a lot easier to adjust if you were knowing that you were fighting Hitler. And, uh, you know, this was a really, really important war to win. But now I think this compounds the uh, stress disorder is when deep down in their heart, I think a lot of them realize that this was all, you know, just wasted time and wasted life and wasted money. And, uh, it, uh, and, and if they can't face that, then I think they harbor those uh, deep feelings and, and that contributes to it. And then all of a sudden the doctor says, well, give him a pill, you know. And well, that's right. And, make him feel better. and again, you're a medical doctor and a veteran yourself, so you can speak directly to this. But that was well known after World War II that if someone thought a war was just, you didn't have as many mental problems. But right. if you don't think it's just, you have serious problems. And it was the Nazis that pioneered drugging their troops with amphetamines and uh, proto-psychotropics. So our military is following uh, what the Nazis did. Yeah. But, you know, whether the war is just or not, what if you... Uh or uh, thinking about maybe this is unjust, and then you suppress those feelings. You don't express them. It's suppression of some of these horrible thoughts. I cannot believe our government would be, you know, do this. You mean that this was all uh, wasted life? This was all done in vain? That is pretty hard to face up. What if you lost a loved one? Isn't it very natural for you want to make them a hero and say, well, he, he didn't die in vain. His life wasn't wasted. He, you know, he died as a great uh, protector of the Constitution. And, you know, and so you have to suppress those feelings. And I think that is where the, 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 uh, the whole problem is compounded. And then they, then they go to the doctor for a pill, uh, and that makes the whole problem that much worse. That's right. Uh, former Congressman Ron Paul is our guest right now. They're on screen. RonPaulChannel.com. Excellent news, media, and liberty-based analysis with a truth bias. If they like to tell the truth, it's, it's the opposite of the dinosaur media. Briefly, dinosaur media's numbers are dropping about 24% a year, uh, according to Nielsen. At this rate, uh, MSNBC, CNN will have less than 100,000 viewers within two years. Uh, one of our affiliates uh, has ratings of over 100,000 uh, listeners in three hours, uh, Congressman. What do you predict is going to happen when when my show has 3 million and the Ron Paul channel has millions and Drudge Report has 10 million a day and all this? What are they going to do? We're already the real media. What is the system going to do uh, to counter this? Well, you, they make efforts, you know, they uh, try to think that they're competing by having a website and, you know, they can go watch videos and this sort of thing. But the, the business is going to change, you know, um, I think the radio business will change uh, and they're going to go more to independent radios and webcasting and all these other things and podcasting. Uh, Market well, based. Hopefully they're all put out of business. Yes. But, but the, the, the tragedy will be is, uh, you know, in a totalitarian country, and we have a little bit of this here where the government has to subsidize the media. So you might see it might get much worse, even though it's bad already, uh, even though it will not give us news and the people won't want it, but they'll rec the people will recognize it. But who knows? It might mean that uh, the taxpayer is going to be forced to pay for some of that stuff because I think the advertisers who still can make a market choice won't do it. They're going to go to uh, the different sites to uh, advertise and target their advertisement. That's why this is so attractive to so many of the people who are trying to sell products uh, on the air. I agree with you, though. They're going to pure state-run financed media uh, to counter us in trying to censor the new media, trying to censor web freedom. Absolutely, and it's constantly uh, being threatened. Uh, and um, I'm all, since I don't know all the technology involved in, in uh, how the Internet works, I'm betting on uh, the free market and free individuals and the fact that this is universal to come up and counteract everything that the government does, you know, get around it. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping technology uh, is the vehicle that undermines the authoritarianism that exists in so many that's of our right. governments, and that's what I'm hoping for. That's right. We can compete and innovate our way out of the tyranny. That's our greatest renaissance hope. All right, in the four or five minutes we've got left, sir, I want to get into what you've really been focusing on so eloquently. We've got a professor coming on later who backs you up. Uh, this issue of what's unfolding uh, over in the Ukraine and the demonization by state-run media of anyone 
that doesn't want to have the EU and NATO take over Ukraine. I mean, they've taken over 90% of the country. They overthrew the government. This is a big defeat for Russia. As you said, Putin's no angel, but I mean, the media over here is acting like Russia is starting World War III. Instead, the West is starting a new Cold War. Uh, do you agree with that? Absolutely. That's what they're doing. And there's, I go back and forth from, you know, the American people are buying into it again. They're listening to all the TV and going along with it. But then I go and I look for a glimmer of hope and we find out that occasionally they'll do a poll. And that poll will show the American people are still coming toward our position and saying, no, we don't need another war. We don't need to, you know, be involved. We don't need troops on the ground. But I don't think the average person on the street yet realizes how much money we put into messing around with the internal affairs of Ukraine for the last 10 years plus, uh, you know, with all the uh, National Endowment for Democracies, uh, even uh, uh, Victoria Nuland admitted they, that the, uh, the Department of State has spent over $5 billion Incredible. interfering, you know, with the government. So, uh, yes, there are problems around, and uh, like you said, the, we, we can't defend Russia as being the angels, but uh, it, it, if, uh, if, we, if we just stayed out of it, it would be a big help. There was no help at all whatsoever for us to be involved there. The evidence is so clear. Look, whether it's uh, Libya or Egypt or Afghanistan or Iraq, Syria, we're over in Syria giving money and helping and aiding this, the uh, al-Qaeda. So, uh, but I think the American people are waking up. They might not see it quite like I do about minding our own business and have non-interventions like our founders wanted, but the, the conservatives are saying, you know what, well, we are broke. You know, there has to be a limit. Have you noticed that already, that some people are saying, well, that, that we, we better wake up because, uh, you know, the, the bank is empty. And That's all right. They're doing is, all they're doing is printing money, so we have to quit. Well, that's the issue is that the socialist and people want us bankrupt. They want us dependent. Uh, they want to wreck the, the golden goose so they can control everything. Uh, two final questions for Ron Paul of ronpaulchannel.com. Dr. Paul, uh, looking at the presidential run, hands down, your son's the best candidate. He's leading in all the polls. Uh, Ted Cruz is also, I think, a great guy, but I don't completely overall trust him because I haven't known him like I've known your son for 16 years since he was campaigning for you to get back into Congress for 17 years. I do trust Rand. He's done a great job. How, uh, how do we get behind Rand? He's clearly going to run for president now. He started the exploratory group. Uh, he's the front runner. What are you planning to do to support him for president? Well, mainly, uh, you know, trying to get people to understand the issues because a person like Rand or myself or anybody that agrees with us, the problem is that the general population thinks it's not in their best interest if you don't want to promote war and welfare. Well, they want welfare. What we have to do is educate people uh, to the point where we're realizing it's in their interest. Most people vote in their own self-interest, and as long as they think they're going to get something, you know, the... the uh, the big bankers know exactly what they're doing. It's in their own interest. But we have to get people to understand it's their, in their best interest to vote for somebody like Rand. Uh, and even if they want to, even if they will be charged with saying, oh, they don't care about the poor people. You've heard that enough. They think that we, we have no concern. But the whole thing is, if anybody had any compassion or any concern for the poor, uh, they ought to believe in liberty because the evidence is so clear that the freer a country it is, the more prosperity and uh, the, the greater chance that we have for peace. But uh, it's mainly getting that out, mobilizing people, energizing people, getting supporters, sending money. All these things are necessary for a campaign to be successful. What about a Rand Paul, uh, Ted Cruz ticket? Do you think Ted Cruz would run as VP? Oh, I have no idea. I imagine uh, not too many people turn it down. <laughs> well, I like Ted Cruz. Uh, what's your view of him? Well, I, I I have a hesitation about his foreign policy. You know, I do too, yeah. I, I'm a little less interventionist than, than he is on, on foreign policy. But, you know, he uh, he's tough, and uh, he certainly agrees with us on, on uh, the, the medical care system in this country and how bad it is and what we ought to do. So. Speaking of that, lastly, 
Obamacare. He says we can't repeal it. 80% in many polls are against it. Uh, but the Republican leadership, you know, helped write it as, as you exposed. What would you do, sir, to, to dismantle this? Everything you said about it has now come true. Your analysis was absolutely on target. It's worse than we even thought in many cases. It's bankrupting the country, raising payroll taxes on poor people. Uh, you know, the, the architect of it, Ezekiel Emanuel, admits it's meant to wreck the system. I mean, isn't that criminal? Absolutely. And if you could, um, you know, if you, if you had a Congress to pass a law to repeal it, you could. Uh, the odds of that happening are very slim. But there has to be a way that you can legalize freedom of choice to get out of an evil program, you know. And we sort of had that going, but now with Obamacare, it's been so de-emphasized. De and that is the right of you and I to get out and take care of ourselves and get a tax deduction and have a medical savings account. Uh, people were just flocked to that once they realized, uh, you know, uh, the, that these lies about Obamacare, you know, are lies and that people aren't going to be very happy with it. So we always have to have the right to opt out. We always uh, should have, uh, you know, just in, in schooling, you have to have a right to get out of the government schools. You have to be able to go to a private school or do homeschooling. And when they eliminate that, then we're in big trouble. And in medicine, they're essentially trying to do that for you, to, for any of us to opt out of the system. And right now, there's a lot of unhappy people because it's based on pure authoritarianism. Wow. Well, uh, former Congressman Ron Paul, Ron Paul Channel. Dot com. Thank you so much for your tireless defense of liberty, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Bye. sir. All right, there he goes. Uh, just incredible the way he analyzes everything. In fact, he crystallized it. Obamacare is an evil program. It's an evil system. We should have a right to not be part of it. This is a basic civil God-given right. The way he described Ted Cruz as tough. Ted Cruz is tough. 28 hours not going to the bathroom. Staying eloquent. I've tried to do a 24-hour broadcast. I can hardly do it. I mean, he's tough. And uh, you've got his wife's background on the Council on Foreign Relations and Goldman Sachs. It is not good. But I follow the record of Judge a Tree by its fruits. The fruits are about 95% good with him. They're about 97% good with Rand Paul. They're not going to get elected unless they play some politics. Um my gut tells me that Ted Cruz deep down does love liberty and understands the way the wind blows, too, that liberty is the only thing that's going to save this country. A lot of the establishment doesn't want to totally wreck the country. They just want power. And I think Ted Cruz kind of represents that, the non-insane establishment. Because the establishment's figuring out when real tyranny comes in, there's not going to be a bunch of seats at the table. Whoever gets the ring of power in this new tyranny, this technocracy, is going to shut down all their competition. Everyone, the common folks, working class, uh, middle class, wealthy, nouveau riche, ultra rich, the, uh, everyone. You really don't want tyranny. It stinks. It's bad. There's a small group of evil people who literally hate families, literally hate God, literally hate justice. I've studied it. In all my 20 years of work, 19 years on air, no one ran Paul actually 18 since like 1996. In all of it, it just comes down to these people want the power to persecute good people. They want the power to control the media and tell an actress, you got to have sex with me if you want to be in state-run media. They want the power to have the street signs the color they want. They want the power to tell you how, what your house can look like or what drugs your kids have got to take. They want to run your life. I don't want to run people's life. I don't want to tell my crew what to do. I want to lead them by example and show them how to defeat tyranny. I do not want to sit there henpecking them, standing over them, telling them what to do all day. Well, the establishment wants that. And you talk to somebody like Ron Paul, I mean, he's the real deal, folks. And that's why socialists and tyrants and control freaks everywhere don't like him. Because collectivism destroys people. Collectivism makes people dependent. Collectivism makes people weak. Victor Hugo, the French philosopher, said it best. Adversity makes men, prosperity makes monsters. Adversity makes men, prosperity makes monsters. Well, that's Alex Jones talking to Ron Paul that was taped earlier. Alex is going to be joining us live tomorrow on his own show at 11 a.m. Eastern.